Good morning and uh, welcome to your House Education Committee. Um, today is Thursday, April 22nd, 2021. And um, we're gonna be in today's session with testimony on Senate Bill S-13. Um, it's an act relating to the implementation of the pupil waiting factors report. Um, with us this morning is uh, Mr. Albergini. He was the superintendent of Mount Mansfield Modified Union District. And uh, is it Edie? Eddie? Edie? Edie Gannon, right? Yeah, um, Edie Granny. Yeah, great. And who's the board chair of uh, the Mount Mansfield Modified Union School District? And Aaron McGuire, who's back with us, Director of Equity and Inclusion, Essex Westford School District. And uh, welcome to all of you this morning. And um, I think we'll start with uh, Mr. Albergini this morning. Testimony, if you uh, are ready to go. I am, thank you. Thank you. Um, hopefully I'm not echoing. I'm out at one of our schools. Um, pretty quiet here, we're on break, but um, still a lot going on in the building. I'm gonna be referencing um, some notes today um, that I took after examining the waiting study again yesterday. But um, first I, I wanted to start by saying that uh, I, I fundamentally support examining and considering changes um, that provide additional funding for students that are economically disadvantaged and fully recognize the, the need to update um, some of the categorical grants and analyze the pupil waiting because it's been, you know, approximately 20 years since um, it has been adjusted. Um, additionally, I agree, I agree with many of the positions and the findings in the waiting study, um, specifically that additional funding is necessary to equitably and effectively educate economically disadvantaged students. So, um, you know, I, I wanna be very um, careful um, and not coming across in any way, shape or form as apathetic or uncaring or unsupportive of um, additional support for economically disadvantaged students because that is, um, is far from the case. And I, I have some information that I'd like to share with the committee and some questions that I'd ask the committee to consider. Uh, again, I, I reviewed the executive summary and the full summary yesterday and something I didn't notice um, and I hadn't noticed in the past was any mention of the consolidated federal grant money, specifically Title I funds. These are funds that I'm sure you know that are allocated to schools based on poverty factors. Um, and school districts with a higher poverty factor is determined by the US Department of Ed receive more funds than districts with lower poverty rates. Now this is non-education spending revenue, so it's not included in, a, in education spending per equalized pupil or a district's overall education spending. But you could identify it if you look at overall spending. Um, pre the, the waiting study, um, I did a quick analysis as I was looking at some local districts and comparing um, our education spending and overall budget um, to others. And what I found was there were um, some districts who, you know, based on their size and, and scale, um, their education spending were per equalized pupil was pretty close to ours, but their overall spending um, per pupil or overall spending for the overall budget was, um, you know, was, was higher. Um, and, um, you know, I, that might be something um, that the committee wants to consider or a task force. And um, it's something I didn't notice in um, the waiting report. Uh, recently, you know, that uh, I think the ASSER funds demonstrate the differences from district to district and federal support. Um, when you look at the, the outline of the districts, some districts are receiving, you know, 40 to 50% of their total annual operating budget. Um, when you combine ESSER 1, 2, and 3, while others are in the single digits. Um, for example, Mount Mansfield is about 1.4% of our annual budget. Uh, based on the communication that I've received from the AOE, uh, 
Title I funds are allocated in the same man manner as ESSER. Um, I may have missed it, but I didn't see included in the waiting study any reference to the uh, consolidated federal grant monies or Title I. Um, I also have some questions, and I didn't notice this in the waiting study, around the differences in home values from town to town and how this um, affects the tax rate and um, how education spending per equalized pupil um, uh, affects funding. Uh, some of the differences in tax rates from town to town and how this might influence taxpayers. MMU comparatively gets very little Title I funding um, and therefore non-special ed support, which most of our um, non-education spending is from special education support, uh, um, that non-special uh, ed support uh, services um, and resources that that comes directly from our education spending. This is also something that's different from district to district. Uh, when I also want to share that, you know, I understand whenever you're trying to create equity, there are layers of complexity um, that are needed, and that uh, this is in no doubt a complex endeavor and process because there's a lot of variables to consider. Um, some of these are, you know, who might benefit from the changes to the student waiting, um, not just schools, but um, community members, taxpayers. Um, you know, how will, how, will, how will it be regulated so that, um, you know, it, you're able to attain the intended purposes? You know, how will the state um, make sure that it's not incentivizing unintended outcomes or inefficiencies? When I, I looked at the preliminary analysis from February 6, 2020, that the Joint Fiscal Office um, uh, offered, and um, in it, uh, it indicated that, and this is based on FY20 and some of the variables um, that were outlined in that analysis, and MMU's tax rate would go up 35 cents if um, the weighting changes were, um, enacted uh, based on the recommendations in the waiting study. Um, this would be catastrophic uh, for our district and, uh, um, and our students. And I, I'm not underestimating that. Um, uh, the cuts we'd need to make to pass a budget would be extreme. Uh, a three to five cent increase would be significant and very difficult. So I, you know, I wanted the the, the committee to hear a little bit about that. Um, and I also wanted to share that Mount Mansfield was one of the first districts that unified. Um, we repurposed a school um, uh, pretty recently to better serve students, number one, uh, to eliminate central office costs and rent that were not going to students at all, um, to optimize space in the, in the buildings and staffing and to right size classrooms. Uh, the districts made some really difficult decisions over the last pe uh, several years. You know, these decisions are intended to offer students a high quality education at a cost that the electric grid can support. Post merger um, and unification of the school district, um, the school, the district's tax rate has been stable, you know, up or down slightly. While our, our K role, um, uh, K to 12 enrollment, fortunately, has, has stopped declining um, pretty much. It's leveled off, it's relatively static. Um, raising the tax rate um, without any decisions or spending adjustments of the district you know, has me really, um, really concerned. Um, and I'm not sure what we would do if we uh, honestly. Um, if the tax rate went up, um, you know, five, 10 cents, that would be incredibly difficult. And some of the cuts we'd be forced to make would be um, ones that I, you know, I really don't even want to think about or contemplate. Um, so, you know, in closing, I, I ask and hope that um, if the task force is put together, that it considers some of the information and complexities that I've shared with the committee today. I'm also hopeful that we can offer additional support to economically disadvantaged students um, uh, 
uh, while not increasing the property tax rates on hardworking taxpayers in, in Mount Mansfield Unified Union School District. So that lot there, um, appreciate you listening to, to some of my, um, the information that, that I've garnered you know, over the last several weeks and um, hope that, um, that we can find some ways to better support economically disadvantaged students um, and not you know, raise the tax rate um, on folks in Mount Mansfield who um, you know, are really supportive of our schools and you know, have sacrificed a lot, certainly in the pandemic, but over the last several years to make good decisions to uh, best meet the needs of students. Well, thank you for your comments, uh, Mr. Albergini. It's uh, much appreciated. We do have a couple of questions. Um, Representative Austin. Yes, thank you for your testimony. You made a lot of points in your presentation. I'm wondering if you could possibly create some language that our committee could look at in terms of questions so we could look at them you know, to propose for the uh, task force. force. To, to get answers to your questions or for them to look at it. Would that be possible? I'll unmute. Would you want me to do that now or at a later no. time and send those to you? Probably, um, I think as soon as possible, but just to frame them in questions so we, yes. as we can look at them and say, we'll include these questions for the task force to study. Yes, I can, I can certainly do that. One right off the top of my head would be, you know, were um, consolidated federal grant monies considered in the waiting study? Um, you know, and again, I wanna, we, at our board meeting last week, um, you know, we, we try to be really delicate around this because we don't wanna come across as um, not caring about students that are living in poverty. We have students that are economically disadvantaged in our school district, and we know it costs more money to educate them. But I think it's really important to, if you can be comparing apples to apples um, and oranges to oranges and get a full breadth of what the revenue picture looks like for school districts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Till. <clears throat> John, it's so nice to see you. Um, how are you? I hope you're well. Um, when I know you've been concerned about how the poverty calculation um, is arrived at, and I know you've made some inquiries about that as I have. Um, and my most recent inquiries um, have uh, turned up that in all of the Mount Mansfield district in, that we had 107 students considered poverty students. That didn't seem very realistic to me. We also had in the town of Richmond, zero, and in the town of Jericho, zero, which again, is just does not make any sense to me. Um, so I just, I just wondered if you had gotten any more information than I have um, or if, if you've come to any better understanding of how this is getting, these crazy numbers are, are getting calculated. Well, it's great to see you too, George. I hope you're well. And thank you for coming today. Um, this is a super important topic and, and one that um, you know, truly affects our, our school district. I have no idea how they came up with those numbers. I've got to be totally honest with you. That is not accurate. We know that's not accurate. Um, you know, we, I know folks in both towns that are um, living in poverty and economically disadvantaged, and I, I, um, I haven't gotten good answers. And it is much more complex than I ever thought it would be. Um, and, uh, and that's another, I mean, I guess that's an, a, a good segue, I think, to making sure that a task force or um, in the legislature and, and possibly um, important committees understand, you know, the, the actual math that goes into coming up with these poverty counts, because as um, uh, Representative Till shared, that's just not, that's not the case. Um, those, those numbers are not right. Thank you. I, I would like to take a moment um, to welcome 
Chair Ansel and members of her committee, the Ways and Means Committee to this conversation. Nice to have you back with us again today. Um, Representative you. Williams. Yes, thank you. I, I just have a quick question. Uh, I was curious as to your success rate on getting your school budgets passed. You know, it's been really good. Um, I would say it's been a, a very good. And, and one of the reasons is um, we have been able to control our tax rate. And one of um, something that I think is important for folks to know is that, again, we get very little revenue from the federal government, with the exception of special ed, which is categorical um, in Vermont. And based on the number of IEP students that you have um, and what their needs are, so almost all of the support that we give students either who, uh, who are at risk comes from education spending. So it comes from property tax revenue. And we have been um, diligent and worked really, really hard to make sure that we're optimizing all the resources um, and literally every nickel and penny um, of taxpayer support um, so that it's going to kids, students' needs um, and helping them be successful, you know, um, post high school. Thank you. Representative Till. Yeah, I, and I could speak to that too, as I was the finance chair on that board for a number of years. Um, and since the merger, we have done very well. It kind of correlates with when I left the board. I don't know if there's anything that <laughs> to explain it there, but prior to the merger though, we had multiple years where we did, where we failed budgets, and um, it it was it was not a ta an area where it was given that we would pass it. I mean, I I went through at least three failed budgets while I was there. Yeah, that's um that uh, and I was uh, I was around for some of those budget failures pre pre the merger, um, and part of it was the volatility in the tax rate. Um, and um, people just saying, look, we're, we can't afford a 10 cent increase in our tax rate. And you get into you know, crisis budgeting and you make decisions um, that are not necessarily in the best interest of students. So I don't wanna relive that um, because um, as Representative Till said, it, you know, it's, it's not good for the school community and it certainly isn't good for students. And that part of the reason why I wanted to come today to talk to the committee is because I'm very concerned um, that if we, if the tax rate goes up without any decisions or actions or adjustments of the district, it will be a big, big deal. Well, thank you for presenting today and uh, we'll move on to uh, Ms. Ganning. Um, yep, yeah, so I'm, I'm here to support John. I'm here to share similar things. Um, I will restate a little bit of what um, George said. We had about, our last budget didn't pass about seven or eight years ago. Um, and that was, I believe, a three or four cent increase um, in, our, in our tax rate that didn't pass. I think it, it was not a lot. Um, we really have been incredibly careful about the, the way we spend money. And we've really looked at everything that, um, that you all have done in Montpelier to make schools more efficient and to make sure that costs, um, that costs to taxpayers go, the money goes directly to students. And so we, um, we spend a lot of time and a lot of energy ensuring that our students who are at risk get the supports that they need um, we support summer programs for them. We support after school programs. We support as much as we can. And one of the focuses of our board is how to, um, how to, how to um, bridge that gap for those students and how to make sure that all of our students are high achievers. So we are just very concerned the way that this is looking. Um, it, would, it would be at a huge detriment to those students as well as well, to all of our students to have that large of a tax increase. I don't really have anything else to add. Thank you. I see uh, Chair Webb is 
back with us and I will turn this meeting back to the chair. Thank you. And I was able to hear part of your, your testimony. And uh, I um, am, will say that we are going to have a little bit more of a discussion at 11 o'clock regarding uh, the Title I and uh, allocations and how that's allocated. And I'm pretty sure that we're not going to get a full answer because I think we're all pretty struggling with, with how that is actually calculated at the federal level. Um, but I take your point. Um, of uh, looking at how consolidated federal funds need to be addressed in this as well. Thank you for that. Um, that was it. So I think we're up to Erin McGuire from the Westford, Essex Westford School District. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me. Good to see all of you. I'm Erin McGuire. I'm the Director of Equity and Inclusion for the Essex Westford School District. Um, I'm also the Co-Director of Student Support Services. It's worth noting that I'm also the president of the National Organization for Special Education Directors and will be um, inserting some comment around this topic related to uh, some federal requirements around special education as it intersects with the topic. Um, but really, I come to you today as a representative of Essex Westford and um, Essex Westford School District is a district that would be substantially impacted by implementation of the models that were included in um, UVM's study. And um, we would stand to lose a sizable amount of programming in order to manage uh, forward with a reasonable tax rate. I think um, John's comments apply to Essex Westford as well. Um, one of the things that feels really important to share is that Essex Westford has taken <clears throat> taken on equity as a substantial component of our work in our school district. And part of that effort is recognizing redistribution of resources as it relates to historically marginalized populations. It also means that um, we uh, invest in ensuring that the voices of people who have not historically been represented at the table are at the decision making table and the work in the district comes in many forms um, and it feels important to note that because uh, it seems that this, if the implementation of this is dedicated to equity. And so it wouldn't be reasonable in the same way that John shared for Essex Westward to come to the table and say, oh, we don't, you know, we don't want you to um, consider this because we will lose, as opposed to saying equity is essential. And that does sometimes mean redistribution of resources related to historically marginalized populations and underserved populations. And so um, I come to you today with some requests and recommendations in order to help that move forward um, for our state in a way that um, supports all of us forward toward equity. We are all better off from an equitable system. Um, and so that is really critical on the front end of the testimony. Um, in looking at the design of the task force under S13, um, one of the things that I think we see as missing in the bill itself is the voice of practitioners. I'm grateful for the engagement with our state statewide organizations in the context of who sort of has voice in this process. But one of the things we would like to strongly suggest, and I think it's um, supported by this conversation too around the federal uh, Title I funds and the process by which the numbers show up and how that happens is to ensure in this bill that there are actual simulations of decisions that get made. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, we have done a lot of work in this state to try to create a myriad of changes in educational funding as well as practice. And sometimes I think we could do a better job of actually modeling out the impacts of what's about to happen based on ideas or decisions that get floated at the statewide policy level. So would really encourage that uh, simulations take place. I think um, maybe a sampling of large and small districts and ensuring that the sampling and the simulation activities incorporate the administrators in the districts that are being simulated so that you can hear and understand in that process from the people who would have to implement that, maybe board members as well from those districts. Um, so that's something that we would like to recommend to the task force. 
In addition, we'd like to really recommend that there is a conversation about phasing in the impact. Um, one of the things that we know, and I, I think John uh, described it well, is that when you have sudden and radical changes in funding in school districts in either direction, it can be really challenging to implement quickly. And so one of the ways that we can avoid, um, you know, program to program arguments about who's supposed to stay and who's supposed to get cut, as well as um, unexpected increases in funding and how to spend those well is to move in through a, a phase in of the impact as opposed to a sudden impact. And so um, this also, I think, would allow us to think about implementing in a way that really enhanced efficiencies to John's point, and um, as opposed to drastic cuts in order to maintain a tax rate. In the same way that uh, was described earlier, I think we would struggle to um, pass a budget with a 35 cent increase. That, what we would need to do is cut our spending. Um, we would need to bring the spending down. That means cuts to positions. We know that 80% of budgets are staff Thing, and uh, we would have to really do some work around that likely. Um, so we think phase in might be a good approach and would encourage that to be a consideration within the um, within S13 formally as a suggestion for consideration. You know, Brigham was a long time ago and the Brigham case sought to bring equity into the Vermont education finance system. Um, and over the years, we've had a number of changes to try to bring equity into the funding system in Vermont. Um, and if we're going to center equity and investment in students, then it seems important in some way to ensure that implementation in whatever it might look like through this process is not used to necessarily simply decrease tax rates in places where there is more investment. So I think you know, EWSD is supportive of an equitable reallocation of resources to ensure that our most needy students have increased investment at its core. And that feels hard to talk about if that money is going to be used to decrease tax rates as opposed to invest in student outcomes. And so we would ask that you think about that as you look forward into the future of this task force. Um, and, and, you know, if, if we're decreasing tax rates, I'm not sure we're getting at equity and equity is what this is about. Um, two more sort of topics, and then I'll end with a couple of uh, review recommendations. In S13, you've included a component of the intersection of Act 173 and the people waiting say, well, the Senate did. Um, and, um, and I think that makes good sense. VCSEA and other organizations have said, you know, we really feel like the intersection of Act 173 and implementation of this people waiting factor report is really important. Um, Act 173 and the census implementation will absolutely decrease the amount of state investment at the state level in special education and move those costs to the local side of the ledger. So we have state funds that we implement in special education and we have local funds that we implement in special education. And, um, and so while we implement Act 173 census models, and then we also implement a substantial change to the weighting factors, those will intersect in ways that are substantial and the simulation activities that I described should absolutely be a component of this, this Act 173 census change. So please be careful about modeling without the contextual underpinnings of our current circumstances. That gives false narratives related to outcome. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that when we model these changes that we do so in the context of implementation of the census grant design under Act 173. Um, the last area of focus, and I don't, I see a hand up. Do you want me to keep going or? Why don't, you, why don't you finish this point and then we'll get to Representative Moslin. Okay, thank you. Um, so the last point I would like to make is one that I have made in front of several of you before, which is that in special education at the federal level, there is something called maintenance of effort. 
Maintenance of effort requires that you spend at least the same amount as you did the year before between state and local dollars. That's specific to LEAs, the local education agency. There is something called maintenance of effort at the state level, which I think the agency of education has come and presented on a series of times. There is a separate maintenance of effort requirement related to local districts. And so it's important to note that regardless of whether we're talking about Act 173 or we're talking about implementation of the waiting study, there are limitations on the amount of cuts that can happen in special education without substantial reduction to the federal dollars in special education that show up in Vermont. And so I just want to make sure everyone is really clear and understands that as we move into these conversations, because the more we reduce spending um, and try to shift funds into other spaces, there are some limitations in special education. That protection is at the federal level in order to stop states from divesting in students with disabilities as a marginalized population who needs the investment in order to ensure the future success for those students. So just wanna make sure everyone understands that there is a component of special education funding that intersects, especially as we look at strong impact from the waiting factor report in a district plus the Act 173 implementation of the census grant. Um, it doesn't mean we can't do these things. It's all about knowing your impact. If we don't know our impact, then you know our decisions will not land as, as we may have intended. Um, so with that, that, just a couple of uh, overarching recommendations, a recommendation to phase in the change, a recommendation that we expect investment in students when we redistribute resources as opposed to in, uh, a decrease in, in tax rates, to run simulations on final decisions from the task force to ensure that we understand our impact, to expect that we simulate within the context of Act 173 funding model shifts, and also to create a clear understanding in the language related to maintenance of effort for special education as we continue to make changes to the Vermont funding system for education designed to ensure equity for students. So thanks, I hope that was helpful for all of you. Um, all of those points are in written testimony for your re-review should you need them. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Representative Maslin. Yep. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and and thank you for coming in today. Your help, your testimony was very helpful. You said um, not too long ago in your testimony that if if more resources are put in for some of the things in the waiting, that that, that the burden will shift to the local level. Could you be more specific about why that would happen? <laughs> So um, my comments were specific to the Act 173 census model implementation, where um, the, the phasing of the Act 173 census model for special education funding right. yeah. will decrease for many districts the investment in special education from the state level and therefore will shift the ledger to the local level. That's tied to that maintenance of effort conversation I just had because local plus state has to equal the prior year. There are some exceptions to that, but efficiency in systems is not one of those exceptions. If you have a high cost student leave, you can reduce your maintenance of effort by that amount. But generally speaking, it's the federal expectation that in special ed, we invest the same amount from the prior year between state and local. So if the state is implementing a certain amount and the local is implementing a certain amount, those together equal what you need to spend the next year. And if we see the census grant decrease the investment from the state to the locals related to special education, in order to maintain effort, we will have to increase the amount of local dollars invested in special education. I hope that helps. It was less related to the specifics of the waiting study, other than to say that um, any reduced programming that happens from the waiting study also cannot be within the context of special education unless we're going to uh, decide that we are not maintaining effort 
federally at the local level for special education, um, it will need to come out of general education programming primarily. So just as a point of reference, as we think about the impact of the weighting factor study and implementation of it. So, and, and maintenance of effort is held at the state level as well as the local level, correct? So both correct. are held to it. They are separate calculations right. as well. And interestingly, under federal law, the state has more flexibility related to maintenance of effort than the locals. So for example, during COVID, state maintenance of effort um, had some flexibility to it from the US Department of Education. There is no sort of external administrative flexibility under the local maintenance of effort requirements under IDEA. Those are static in statute. Thank you, Representative Conlon. Uh, thank you, same topic. And uh, Aaron, thanks very much for your testimony. It's been very informative. Um, in what you did say, and this is more of a clarification, uh, you said that the Act 173 census funding model promises to decrease state investment in special education and shift costs over time to the local side of the ledger. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not true for all districts. That's just, again, much like the pupil waiting study, some will potentially see a benefit, some will potentially see a, a, a decrease. Yeah, the, I mean, the implementation of Act 173 requires that the original census grant be a combination of a certain set of years of spending, and it's not the current year. And so unless a school district has um, decreased its special education spending one year over another, which is unlikely, especially given maintenance of effort, as well as climbing costs of special education, then the original census amount that a school district will receive will likely be lower than the prior year's um, state investment. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, it, uh, my understanding is a little different, but my understanding is also a lot more uh, basic and simplified. I think you're probably far more correct than I am. So thank well, you. And I, also I, know I mean, that, you know, ultimately the goal of Act 173 is to sort of level out the census grant, but it's also my understanding that ultimately there was a goal to save funds at the state level in special education through the conversation, that it wasn't um, simply a, an attempt to shift to a census grant without um, reducing some of the special education costs. We know that special education in Vermont is very expensive, particularly as you compare it nationwide. So I didn't necessarily design my comments related to the underpinnings of Act 173. I think there are definitely important conversations to have on both sides of that. And BCSEA, um, of which I'm a member, did support the implementation of a census grant. We, we are supporting supportive of moving forward with that model um, and, at, and ready to try to support and think with school districts related to how to manage some of those impacts. When you capitalize that with the um, impact to some districts from the uh, implementation of the weighting factor report, um, there's, there's, just, there's some substantial potential for challenge for some districts, not all. Uh, I absolutely agree about yeah. the importance of uh, looking at the intersection of those two issues. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. I do believe it was modeled in a couple of ways how that was factored in as well in the in the weighting study, whether it was just considered based on ADM or perhaps was a weighted number as well, which is in her calculations. Um, Representative Williams. Yes, thank you. Uh, earlier in your testimony, you mentioned something about uh, uh, redistribution mm -hmm. of the funds. Mm -hmm. um, is there a policy or a written guarantee or, or any document that guarantees that these monies would go directly to the students? Not that I know of. I mean, it's one of the reasons that I... Do, do you mean locally as we're doing this work in our district or are you talking about through the implementation? Uh, locally. Uh, um, so locally, we are in the process of developing um, a, an equity policy, and we subscribe to the concept of investing where investment has been lacking um, in order to address um, systemic barriers 
for students where that has been present. Um, and so that's a conversation. It's not um, sort of a formal written document, but is a conversation that we have regularly as we make decisions and ask ourselves questions about whether or not our decisions center equity. So as we have conversations about our budget, Equity is an underlying factor and ensuring that we are having those conversations is something that our school board and our administrators are dedicated to having uh, to ensure that that conversation about where are we investing and who's benefiting most from the dollars we invest is something that uh, we have conversation about. But it's not sort of what I would describe as a formal policy. It's um, it's more of a practice and uh, an, an overarching umbrella or maybe even a foundation of our budgeting process. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, just a question about Title I. We have heard testimony that the state sends Title I money back. And when I talk to people around the country, they can't believe we're sending Title money back. Um, and we heard from one district that it's very hard to plan budgeting when you have to hire before you know what your, your funds are. Are you as well finding that you're sending Title I money back? Um, I, I am unaware that we have sent Title I money back, but I do not manage those funds. Our uh, Director of Learning and Innovation does. And what I would say to that comment is that it is very challenging given some of the federal restrictions on those monies and the timing of the uh, knowledge of how much we have versus when we budget, that that is an active challenge in our system. Um, we are regularly in conversation trying to figure out how to manage those issues for certain. Um, I'm not sure if it's resulted in us needing to send money back. I would hope not. Um, our goal is always to invest every dollar that we receive as, um, as best we can to meet the needs of students. Um, I also, earlier in the testimony, there was comment about the federal um, percentage of students who are socioeconomically disadvantaged. And one of the things that I'm worried about as I was listening to that, this isn't in my written testimony, but it occurred to me as I was listening to John talk about it, um, is that we are about to have some real limitations in identifying the numbers of students who are socioeconomically disadvantaged, because one of the primary ways we do that is through the free and reduced lunch applications. And because of the amazing work work of the legislature and all of the leaders, um, and nationally too, around investment in food during the pandemic. I'm a little bit worried about the number of people who are going to complete those forms, given that they haven't had to in order to get access to food. And so I would encourage um, us to be thinking carefully about how are we defining the numbers, because we wouldn't be using models from 2018-19, right? I mean, we would need to remodel on current numbers. I would assume. Um, and I'm a little bit worried about the free and reduced lunch um, numbers. And I don't, I don't know if John agrees with that or not, but I, I just think we're going to be challenged to know the number of students who are economically disadvantaged if that's the number that we use. Thank you. Um, just up, up to um, not Mansfield, are you aware of sending title? funds back? No, I don't believe so. We, we did, um, we do have some carryover. Um, and as Aaron mentioned, you know, it's complicated because you don't get what your allocation is going to be until you, you know, sometimes um, in the, in the fall of the, of the school year that you're in. So, uh, and you, you, you know, there's some caveats to it where you have to save 15% um, of it, uh, and that um, can become hard to sort of track and manage. But um, but it, we're not we're not sending Title One money back um, that I'm aware of, and we have applied for some carryover waivers, but with, which have been approved. Those are much easier to apply. And I would just uh, just add quickly that I'm you know I'm really concerned about the free and reduced. Uh, um, lunch numbers because they're not going to be accurate. And some of the data that I saw, they're using information from 2017 to 
um, to figure out what the poverty rate is. And, you know, I have big, big questions on the accuracy of that. Thank you. Uh, so I believe uh, we are finished with this section. Very much appreciate your input. Uh, we will be, the, the Education Committee will be looking directly at the questions before the task force. And um, we'll be working on that at some point. It will head over to the Ways and Means Committee and they will complete their efforts as well. So hearing from the field is, is very important uh, as we move forward. Um, so with that, we will move on. I believe we have Patrick Halliday in the room who will help us with EQS. Thank you oh. so much. Yeah. Um, Ways and Means, you are also more than welcome to stay with us. One of the questions in the waiting study has to do with uh, uh, looking at uh, our education quality standards and accountability. So we would love to have you stay or some of you stay, um, whatever works for you. Our doors are open. Representative Kornheiser. We have completely different testimony on an entirely different subject at 1030. Okay. So um, I'm personally interested in this, so I'm gonna stick around for a little bit, but I think we're all gonna drop off um, okay. at some point before 1030. And so just wanna make sure that all the Ways and Means members are aware of that and we okay. will um, exit quietly if we're in the middle of testimony. Thank you. Um, welcome, Patrick Halliday from the Agency of Education, and you are going to help us with uh, the EQS and accountability as we move forward, as it is a question in this, in this um, bill. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Webb, um, Vice Chair Capoli, members of the committee. Um, I, um, I appreciate the opportunity to provide an overview of the ed quality standards, um, but also to just to make sure that I'm answering your questions. Uh, I ask you to interrupt me at any time to ask for clarification as we're going forward. Um, I sent um, some slides today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen if that's all right, just to kind of talk through. There's nothing that's uh, particularly, um, you know, amazing and, and wonderful in those slides, um, but it'll just ground the conversation a little bit. And I think you can probably see them right now. Yes, we can. Screens. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. Good. Let's see here. There we go. So the education quality standards were uh, State Board of Education Rule 2000. They're adopted in 2014. Um, you know, I. I the, the bullets at the top, three bullets there, are just kind of what, you know, the, 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 the preface or the preamble, I guess, to, uh, to those rules around um, substantially equal opportunities for students. But really, when I talk with folks around it, it's really describing what good teaching and learning in Vermont should look like and for Vermont students uh, should look like. Um, and I think that that's kind of the, that was the intent when it, when it came about. Uh, to, to update what those, um, those standards are. I think it's also really important to understand that we're talking about standards, not curriculum or pedagogy. These are what should be learned, not how it should exactly be taught or exactly what the, the content of the curriculum should be. So local school boards uh, at the LEA level have a lot of, um, have a lot of um, ability to determine how EQS are realized within state, other state and federal laws. So that's, there's really a responsibility for, um, for that local school boards to do that interpretation work that's going forward. All right, so I, we think of the ed quality standards in four, uh, five different domains. Uh, and I also wanna be clear that these five domains are not how the actual law itself is organized. It's kind of internally in our office as you know, the categories that we put things into and um, academic proficiency, um, personalization, safe, healthy schools, high quality staffing, investment priorities. And if you go through the law and we, you know, we did this work back in 2016, I believe, um, 2015, yeah, 2015, goodness, um, that you know, we kind of took each part of the law and uh, put it underneath one of these headings for us to, to think a little bit more um, succinctly um, about the different pieces of it. Um, so walking through those uh, under academic proficiency, there are a number of things that I think that, uh, that would fit under that, uh, just general instructional practices. 
um, which I'll talk a, a little bit more on when I get to personalization. Uh, one of the big things is the curriculum content. And so for all of these different areas, uh, literacy, math, science, global citizenship, which is social studies and uh, um, in foreign language, physical education and artistic expression, the State Board of Education has um, adopted learning standards uh, for each of those. And then it's up to individual um, LEAs, SUs, SDs to develop a curriculum and pedagogy in order to meet those standards. One of the things I think that's, pretty, and, and, and it depends on what those learning standards are for each of those. For example, literacy and math is the, um, um, uh, my goodness, I'm blanking here, uh, uh, Common Core State Standards and science um, are the, the next generation science uh, standards, et cetera. One thing that I think is particularly novel under this curriculum content was this idea of transferable skills on the bottom. And these are you know, cross-cutting skills across uh, the entirety of the curriculum um, and that are, uh, are often left out of discussions about curriculum around innovation, problem solving, uh, creativity, et cetera. And they are uh, applicable in, in all parts of those. Um, and, then the, uh, and then I think another important thing is this uh, local comprehensive assessment system, the LCAS uh, as we as shorthand in ours. Um, whereas uh, all schools need to participate in the state uh, accountability system and report those. They also have the responsibility under um, the ed quality standards to develop a local assessment system that really reflects the local decisions that have been made as to how to um, enact um, these various, um, uh, the, the various curricular uh, content areas. And that asks schools to do things to have a, a balanced system. So it's not just relying on, um, on summative uh, SBAC, uh, uh, assessments at the end of the year, um, but also to do formative and, and interim assessments um, that these things should be done in the classroom on a daily basis, but also have benchmarks that are taking place. And it's not just, you know, random saying to teachers that you should be, uh, you should be doing this, but really setting forth uh, an individual system for each school as to, as to how they, or each uh, LEA, as to how they want to be um, thinking about what their local values are and how they're going to be um, how they're going to be assessing those. Are the LCAS at all mixed up in some of our other data uh, challenges that we've, we've been hearing about, such as e-finance? Um, LCAS is not part of e-finance. It wouldn't be a part of e-finance at all. And that's really in, in the, the, the important part, I think, of the local comprehensive assessment system is that this is in, in all of what I'm talking about, ultimately gets down to the continuous improvement plans. And the, the, the LCAS are really supposed to inform continuous improvement and looking at data in a really smart way um, and looking at all data to make decisions about teaching and learning and um, you know, going forward. Um, so the, the, the local comprehensive assessments are not reported um, in the same way, at least at the state level, they're not reported. They're really up to individual LEAs as to how, um, how that's done. So it's also not part of SSDDMS or anything like that? Oh, I don't, I, you know, I, I don't really work super closely with that. So I'm, I'm, I, I, that's, I'm, I, I would be guessing, I don't believe that it is, but I'm not positive. You, you can leave it. <laughs> yeah. Representative James had a question. I do, thanks Chair Webb. Um, I, I think you were getting toward the, the same question that I wanted to learn a little bit more about, which is whether the, the uh, LCAS are simply used by the LEAs to kind of measure their own progress and hold themselves accountable or whether they're used by AOE to hold districts or SUs accountable? Yeah, very much the, uh, the former. They're, they're used at the local level to inform their own decisions. These are not, um, there are no accountability um, or reporting requirements that, uh, that the state takes from those. We don't publish uh, the LCAS results out. Um, um, so they're, um, yeah, they're, they're very much at the local level. And they're not a, uh, they're not like a statewide framework or um, each, each district can develop its own that feels relevant. So they exactly. vary from, okay. There, there are guidelines within ed quality, the ed quality standards for what, you know, a good um, 
uh, local comprehensive assessment system would look like. Um, but uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of discrepancy or not difference from one um, from one SU to another as to the the specifics of it. For example, I'm just going to use pull something uh, you know just out of the air. You may um, for you may have a local literacy assessment. One group may choose to do. Um, uh, the Fountas and Pinnell literacy uh, um, and another uh, another LEA may choose a completely different literacy assessment uh, for local to inform those decisions, but neither of those are reported out at the state level. Okay, so it's not something you could currently use to, it, like you said, not apples to apples at all. Nope, nope, and okay. and and not in, in the local comprehensive assessment system was not intended to be apples to apples. Okay, thank you. Um, Representative uh, Austin. Just, um, can you just talk a little bit more about the oversight, like kind of the accountability? Who, you know, if it's just at a local level, like how is the AOE, what's the AOE's role in, you know, accountability to make sure that these, um, you know, that academic proficiency uh, standards are being met? Are you talking specifically about the local comprehensive assessment system or just academic proficiency in general? Well, I assume the lo local comprehensive assessment system is one component mm -hmm. of assuring that students are me meeting proficiencies. But, you know, in the end, if there's a school that, you know, when, when you look at their data, they're not um, meeting uh, the proficiencies, they're below proficiencies at mm -hmm. somewhat of an alarming percent, what happens? So um, I'll talk, I, I'll, I'll, let me touch on that right now and um, I, I'll get to that in a little bit more detail at the end. And really this is the, the logic of uh, where the annual snapshot and the integrated field reviews come in and that the integrated field review and annual snapshot together, we refer to as the ed quality reviews, which is the where the opportunities that the state has to go and, and look at individual schools and individual LEAs and say, how are you doing in meeting those education quality standards? Um, the, and, and again, I'll get into this in a little bit more detail, um, although I'm happy to talk about it now too. Um, the annual snapshot is annual and they're all quantitative measures that, that, uh, that come out. Um, and some of those are determined specifically by, the, uh, by federal law. Others of those are, um, um, are, are local or state decisions that we've made. Um, and the integrated field reviews are done every three years. And that's a group of, uh, of educators and uh, staff from the AOE who go on site to individual LEAs and kind of poke around and ask questions and look in classrooms and look at documents. And, uh, and that's where a question about, tell us about your local comprehensive assessment system would come, come in. Um, in terms of, um, of kind of accountability determinations, um, uh, well, first, I should say that both uh, the integrated field reviews and the uh, annual snapshot are organized around these same five um, domains. So you get indicators on the annual snapshot for academic for prof proficiency and high quality staffing and the like. And then the questions that are asked in the integrated field reviews are also grouped around these same five domains that we're looking for. Uh, specifically though, uh, if there's a school who is um, uh, not meeting standards um, as determined by our Vermont state plan, uh, there are potential for a number of different um, um, either supports or down the line, um, some, some sanctions that would come through. And this is where our uh, um, schools that are eligible for comprehensive or equity supports based on federal determinations come in. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Personalization, I think this is really where we, uh, another area where the ed quality standards start to see a departure for the way that schools were organized, uh, or good teaching and learning was uh, defined in the past. Um, building off of Act 77, which had come out the previous year in 2013, um, it talks more about flexible pathways. Uh, this is where the requirement for uh, personalized learning plans come through local graduation requirements, which again are set by, um, by a school board, um, but really push school boards to think beyond credit hours and uh, the number of hours that students have been in seats, but uh, to, to have um, what we called our, um, 
uh, proficiency-based graduation requirements to, to demonstrate proficiency as opposed to just a uh, collect number of credits. Again, that's up to the local school board as to exactly what those are, are going to be, but um, it is, um, uh, but that was a, a fairly big departure. And then it also, uh, there's a, uh, uh, there's a, a, a part of the statute that just ensures that uh, students have access to uh, career and technical education in there as well. And I think this is a really big, uh, I, I don't wanna you know, belabor it too much, but this is a really big departure for, um, for education, really talking about uh, the personalization approach looking at students as uh, defining education is not something that just happens from you know eight to three every day um, and inside a school but really broadens that um, uh, that definition I'll pause if there are any questions around personalization I don't see any at the moment okay oh yes I do okay. yeah. sorry just how do you measure this like how do you measure you know, that um, this is successful, this uh, initiative? Yeah, uh, great question. And again, it's through the same, uh, the same methods that uh, we were talking about before. There are three different indicators in the annual snapshot that um, look at the number of, um, the number of student, uh, the number of offerings of flexible pathways by schools and the, uh, the number of flexible, uh, the percentage of students who are engaging in one of those flexible pathways so that we, you know, we have that information um, and we've defined what those flexible pathways are. Uh, we also at the, um, at the integrated uh, field reviews. Those, these are exact questions that uh, that we're asking. I remember back in 2015 going on an integrated field review up in Canaan, where I was taken out to a working uh, uh, um, uh, sugar bush as part of their CTE program. And you know that they were showing us this is what flexible pathways means here. There was a large sugar bush, uh, you know, a commercial operation that had been opened up recently. And this was a way for students to get real world experience as a way to uh, potentially uh, turn that into to jobs down the line. So, um, I mean, obviously that's a, an, an anecdotal example, but those are the sorts of uh, uh, pieces of evidence that we look for on the integrated field reviews. Thank you. Um, safe and healthy schools um, are what you know, kind of what it, what it means. There are two different parts I think that are particularly important for this. One is the tiered systems of support. Um, I think that um, that. This is what's uh, evolved into our um, MTSS program, multi-tiered systems of support. Uh, it's also where uh, Act 173 requirement or uh, focus pillar of the educational support team comes in um, as a way to, uh, to, to try to provide supports for students. Um, it defines what uh, um, um, goals for the having uh, school counselors and school nurses on site would be for safety. Um, and then the school facilities and learning environment uh, are both around safety, uh, both the, uh, both physical and emotional safety of students. So these are, you know, talking about fire codes and the like, but also uh, very specifically mentioning the, the learning environment, uh, anti-bullying, anti-harassment um, being named uh, um, specifically in that. One of the ways that we assess this, again, um, through the annual snapshot is um, uh, disciplinary exclusions um, and looking at how those uh, disciplinary exclusions have been um, uh, uh, different schools at different grade levels and the, uh, and the like. Um, and honestly, part of an integrated field review, every integrated field review I've been on, we went on a tour with the facilities manager and uh, you know, he or she pointed out this is the boiler in the school, and this is the last time we had upkeep for this boiler, and um, and you know, um, uh, very very uh, specific examples like that are, are questions that are part of that integrated field review. High quality staffing. Um, this breaks into a, a handful of different things. Uh, there's uh, some. Uh, some language about school leadership in there, and both in terms of uh, the responsibilities of teacher uh, of uh, of principals, um, and then also the um, the 
for needs-based professional learning and staffing, um, specifically what um, professional learning opportunities and it calls for, for example, uh, two hours a month of, of professional development opportunities for teachers during the school day. And so this is why you see a lot of schools pre-pandemic uh, who may have had a late start on Wednesday, because every Wednesday they're using uh, an hour in the morning, you know, using this as an example, not all schools do this, I know, but um, um, using an hour in the morning for professional learning, or maybe a, uh, a two o'clock release for students on a, on, on a Wednesday. Um, and that's something that came directly out of the, uh, the education quality standards, so that during, you know, teachers could really engage in professional learning um, that is based on the specific needs outlined in the continuous improvement plans of, of schools for that. Um, trying to think if there's anything else specific around there. There is a requirement um, for a staff evaluation. There is a, not a requirement for a particular staff evaluation model. Um, so about Oh, I'm going to say 2017, I may be off by a year or two uh, on that, but around 2017, um, all of the schools, um, all the LEAs in the, in the district or in the state um, ex, uh, had to uh, identify what staff evaluation model, and then we had uh, a rubric to make sure that it met the requirements, but we didn't say you had to use the Danielson model or the Marzano model, which are you know, a couple of popular models across the country for staff evaluation, um, but that it did meet those, um, but it met the outlines based on uh, this review. Any other questions on the professional learning or high quality staffing? I think we can keep going. Great. So uh, investment priorities is the, is the last one. Uh, one of the things that's really specific in, um, well, yeah, in the ed quality standards is that for our ratios of staff to students, ratios of principals to teachers um, that, are, uh, that, are, that are minimums. And um, I'd have to pull up my document to get it exactly right, but I believe like um, for every principal, there needs to be, um, for every 10 teachers, there needs to be at least one principal. I, I'm, I'm not going to quote that as exactly right. That's that's from memory. Uh, there are um, there are maximum averages uh, for K to three, and then three to twelve, I believe, are the are the delineations. Again, I have to check it myself every single time for uh, student teacher ratios across a school. Um, there are also for ratios for counselors to students, librarians to students, uh, school nurses to students. Um, and, um, yeah, and, and, and specifically for counselors, the, the ratios differ by elementary and secondary. The secondary ratio is actually fewer students per counselor just because a counselor has, you know, uh, different in responsibilities besides just the counseling, but a lot of, uh, the, the college application process too, that falls into that. And I think what's really important in all of this is really the, no, well, all of this is important, but all of this aims at the continuous improvement plan. And so when you have the education quality standards defining what good teaching and learning looks like, it serves as a, um, as, as a filter for a school or the state to say, what are you doing well? What are the areas where you can be doing better? And for the areas that you need to be doing better, let's really focus on that and the comprehensive uh, improvement plan. What are your goals and objectives? How are you going to achieve those? What are the things that you need specific help in meeting, um, either from the agency of education or, or others? One thing for every, every continuous improvement plan has to have uh, one of the goals that's focused on safe, healthy schools. Um, you can have multiple goals, um, and you almost you always have multiple goals. But one of those goals is is specifically on safe, healthy schools. Uh, the continuous improvement plan, the development of them, is not something that's just supposed to be uh, written at central office uh, by a couple of people, but it's really meant to engage and and defined in statute as uh, or in the rule as including uh, all stakeholders in the community: parents, teachers, uh, other community members. Um, uh, students uh, and the like. Uh, every uh, LEA has to review their uh, continuous improvement plan annually, and it has to be submitted every two years. Although a school, uh, one of the, 
sanctions is not exact right the not the, the the exact right word but one of the uh, uh, requirements for a school who's eligible for equity supports or comprehensive supports under uh, the federal ESSA law um, has to submit a continuous improvement plan annually instead of every two years so that's one of the things that's been done um, and that really defines then you know how you're going to be spending uh, your additional your your funds? Where are you going to focus those funds in order to meet those goals that are that are set out in the preamble that we talked about at the beginning? Um, and then, as I as I referenced in the beginning, if you can see on this slide over on the far left are the educational quality standards. There are education quality reviews are the two things there in the middle that are the uh, the annual snapshot and the integrated field reviews um, and that along with local data through the local comprehensive assessment system and, and, and other things are really what defines the continuous improvement plan. So in the annual snapshot, if your school's um, science performance uh, for fourth grade or your LEA's science performance for fourth grade uh, for students are, who are historically marginalized, we're seeing that continually fall behind. That might be an area that you want to address in your continuous improvement plan. If you see disproportionate number of, um, of um, disciplinary exclusions for uh, our students of color, that might be something you want to consider that you want to address in your continuous improvement plan. Um, and, um, and so really the, the education quality standards are, are the goals, the annual snapshot integrated field reviews are the two tools that the state has to kind of say, how are you doing in, in meeting those goals, all in the service of the, uh, the continuous improvement plan so that that defines what are you going to do to get better. Uh, yeah, I see the hand raised, I'm sorry, please. Sorry, Representative Kylan. Uh, thanks. Um, I'm going to use your word, uh, sanctions. Um, let's say uh, an integrated field review goes to the same school over six, twice over six years. As you said, it's every three years. Correct. Sees the same deficiencies. Let's say it's something as understandable as, I don't know, a building deficiency, a leaky roof or mold or something. Correct. What's the, what's the um, enforcement or sanction that, that, that would force that district to make the needed improvement? Yeah, so there are a couple of different things. It would really depend on the, the nature of it uh, for taking something, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, a leaky roof so that you're in an unsafe position. Uh, one of, I, I didn't get into this, but in the uh, education quality standards, there is, uh, there is the ability for this, uh, the, the secretary of education to intervene and say, this is something that needs to be addressed right away. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, so in a, a situation like that, I would be something that, you know, that would involve the, the state to come in to say this is an unsafe uh, environment. Um, if it's a specific learning, if you see, uh, you know, kind of a continual um, uh, performance problem, discrepancies between one group and another, uh, that's when uh, some of the in, um, uh, some of the tools at hand under under ESSA around um, schools are eligible for e equity and comprehensive supports would be brought in to you know to provide some supports so that schools can uh, can address those um, uh, those those equity gaps further. So it really de de uh, depends specifically on what that would be, but there is uh, there is part of the education quality standards where the secretary has the ability to come in and say these are things that need to be addressed and they need to be addressed. Uh, I guess I, my follow up question would be, or what? So um, the secretary comes in and says, yeah, these really need to be addressed, or else. Yeah, there are there are. Um, there is authority within the education quality standards. Um, and I'm not, I have, I'm, in sharing my screen, I can't pull it up uh, immediately right now, but there are, um, there are, there is authority for, um, uh, for what? There are three or four different things under there, or may, actually maybe not even in the education quality standards, it may be in, in state statute, um, where the, um, the superintendent has the ability to for the state to take over a system for yeah. the uh, the merger of that with a with another LEA um, for you know in, in, and and I and I don't remember the exact four different you know uh, options that are available to um, uh, 
uh, to the secretary in those situations. But there are, you know, there there are options that would do that do exist. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yep. And how many how many are under this this secretary's order at this point? None that I'm aware of. None that I'm aware of. And you know, and and I, and again, I, I I hesitate to you know to use the word sanction. Um, it's it. We really try to use the word support more than than sanction to to figure out not to come in and be the heavy hand. Of course, at times that that has to happen, but um, but it's really to figure out what you know under a continuous improvement framework. What is the challenge, and then how are we going to help you, you know, understand that challenge, and and uh, and address it. I think it would be interesting to to know you know at some point how many. I won't have to know where, but how many uh, are under continuous improvement plan or have been in the past that required the secretary to come in. Yeah, I can find that out. And again, I, I'm not aware of any. Um, no. Usually those, well, that's not true. There, there have been some in the past. Usually they are um, around financial challenges. And um, I, I know that there was one maybe three or four years ago uh, where a number of folks from the, from the AOE ended up, you know, kind of physically going on site and helping to, you know, to straighten out the finance department of, uh, of one SU. That's one example that I know off the top of my head. Okay, thank you. Representative Williams? Yes, thank you. Uh, in reference to that, um, I represent Essex Caledonia. So there is a school in my district that has a roof that needs repair. Um, I believe with your guidance, they uh, can use it when there isn't a, a weight on the top with the snow and such. Um, Help me understand, is the only way that this can be addressed is if the taxpayers vote to have it done? Uh, is there other help? I, do you know what I'm speaking of? So I don't know about the specific, uh, the specific example. Um, and I'm really not an expert on the, the rules of construction. And that's been made clear to me over the course of the last couple, uh, last month. Um, as I've been uh, pretty involved in the recovery planning work uh, for, for schools that are there. Um, there are a lot of things that just I had never heard of. Maybe you are all familiar with the Davis-Bacon rules. These were things that were new to me, uh, you know, uh, six weeks ago. Um, but, you know, so there, there, are, um, there are ways for schools to, you know, to take on construction projects. Um, not all of them are necessarily based on, uh, on local funding. Uh, there are a number of schools right now, if they can make a re uh, show a relationship to whatever the construction need is to COVID in lots of different ways that they can take on that construction project using uh, what we call the ESSER 1 or the ESSER 2 or the upcoming one now, in, in, in actuality, the ESSER 3 funds, uh, which are really big, you know, huge, huge, huge amounts of monies for, uh, for schools coming in, kind of unprecedented amounts of money. Um, all the steps that need to go through with that, we have other folks at the Agency of Education who are uh, immensely more informed um, about the, you know, what needs to be done for, uh, you know, to, to get construction with those funds. Um, okay, so. Cassandra Ryan is the person I would reach out to. And if you want to uh, reach out to me, I can put you in touch with her without a problem. She would be able to answer those questions. And she may be well aware of that particular project too. Now, th um, so the answer is that there are other resources other than counting on a past budget for such a yeah. thing. So um, that's good to know. Yes, and those are very, you know, I, again, I'm not an expert on funding. These, you know, these are better questions for people like Brad James, who comes in front of you uh, regularly. What yeah, I do you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he would, he, would, he would really be able to answer that question with a lot more, you know, detail than I. Uh, what I do know is that, um, for there, there are a lot of schools that are looking at undertaking construction projects using ESSER, fund, ESSER uh, two and three funds that would not have been undertaking those construction projects uh, before those funds became available. And that's unique to the, the current situation that we're in. Thank you. I wanna make sure we get to your next slide, which is the annual snapshot, but I also wanna, um, yeah. Representative Austin and, and I think Representative Nope, just representative Austin. 
just is poverty um, a con consideration in the net in the annual snapshot? So, if uh, it, it, it shows that uh, you know, a certain percentage of students in poverty are not meeting proficiency, let's say in fourth grade reading, and they need and they build that into their improvement plan. Does funding, is there additional funding either through Title I or the state that is attached to that to help with that support? Yeah, so it's certainly something that shows up in the annual snapshot. So um, I've, 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 I've shared uh, slides with you all in the annual snapshot before, so I went pretty, pretty bare bones here just to, with a single uh, shot on this. I'm certainly happy to talk about it in more detail. You should know that the next iteration of the annual snapshot is coming out on, um, we, I, I believe it's going to go live on Monday, um, which is great, except that this particular iteration of the annual snapshot is going to be missing lots and lots and lots of data. There is no SBAC in the 1920 year. There is no, um, so a lot of the assessments that we typically include in there, just they, they didn't exist. So we, there's no way to, um, uh, to, to, put them, uh, to put them in. But one of the things that the annual snapshot allows uh, schools to do is to disaggregate performance by, uh, by student groups. So whether it's, uh, whether it's poverty or whether it's um, students who are on an IEP eligible for special education services, uh, English learner, um, uh, uh, ethnic racial, uh, under, under, uh, ethnic racial minority, et cetera, that you can disaggregate that, in, that data for all of those different ways. Um, and it's one of the things that we really encourage schools to do. In terms of funding, um, I would there, there are a couple of different ways to answer that. So using your example of elementary school students who are in poverty, who are performing, where there's what we call an equity gap in literacy performance. Um, if that, if that school is eligible for equity supports, uh, what that means is they specifically have to name the reason, uh, name a, uh, um, an, an intervention that they're going to be using in order to address that, uh, that, that gap. Uh, and they need to be using some of their title funds uh, specifically to address that gap. There are some schools, uh, a very small number, 15 schools in the state, who are eligible for what we call comprehensive supports. Um, and those comprehensive supports in the same way they need to address where those gaps are, uh, but there is additional federal money uh, that comes uh, to those schools um, who are eligible for comprehensive supports. Um, and for them to be using, um, you know, to, to really uh, engage in that. Other supports that come through, you know, that we you, that we are really working with those schools who are eligible for equity supports to see, you know, what their particular goals are and how the agency might be able to uh, to help uh, address those. If there's expertise there, or at least uh, kind of uh, connecting the dots to put people together. So if you're looking at literacy, you know, what is a, a resource um, uh, that you might want to consider in order to address that particular uh, challenge that you're seeing right there. So I'm just, I, just one more, just I'm trying to understand. We're looking at the weighting study, you know, and increasing the sure. weight in, to, in terms of how to bring about equity, especially I think, you know, towards poverty. And I'm just wondering about this ability of schools to be able to uh, access additional funding to address the issue of poverty or any of the other issues? How, how is that different than the weighting or the weighting amounts that our students are given? So uh, this is separate from the weighting amounts. Um, it's just reporting out data based on uh, a category, a demographic category of an individual student. Right, no, I'm talking about the funding. The funding. So, yeah, and so the, the funding, um, Boy, um, again, I'm gonna I'm gonna defer a lot of this to Brad because I will get a lot of this not exactly right because I'm I'm really I don't deal with kind of like you know the big ed fund funding side of things. I, it's not something that you know that I'm um, I'm well versed on. What I can say is that there is additional um, you know for those schools and comprehensive supports. There's additional federal funding to address those, but in terms of state funding. Um, you know, I and schools should be targeting some of their title funding 
uh, federal title funding for that. But in terms of additional state funding uh, based on poverty, um, that's really a question that others are gonna be much better placed to answer. And I would afraid I would take you down a, um, the wrong road in that. Thank you. Wait. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Patrick. Okay, I think we've got one more slide. And uh, it just a lot of this I've talked about, this is the integrated field reviews that are every three years. Um, they're largely qualitative. They're not strictly qualitative, but they're largely qualitative data that we're collecting. Um, we have not done field reviews for the last year um, for obvious reasons, because we can't get into schools. And uh, the last thing that schools want are um, you know, a bunch of people from outside the community coming in and walking around. Um, the questions that we ask, um, we have kind of broken into what we call a third, third, and third. Um, that a third of the questions are standard for all LEAs that we ask. There's kind of general questions that we want to ask. A third are specific to LEAs based on the review of the last time there's an integrated field review that took place or the results of their, um, their annual snapshot or uh, the results of um, our, our or the team's review of, um, of the documents that have been shared. And then that final third, we ask, uh, we're going to be asking LEAs to create questions that they want us to ask them. So these are around, an LEA says, we've really been trying to address um, science instruction. Um, we really want you to, to, you know, to pepper us on science instruction to see if we've, if we've moved the bar. Are we smarter in talking about how we're going to engage uh, science? Do you see evidence um, of a dedication to this particular, you know, whatever that goal might be across the school? Um, and so that's a, a chance for uh, an outside group to come in and see, are they seeing evidence of that thing that the LEA has found, uh, has stated this value? And the final thing just to say about the integrated field reviews, um, they're, they're facilitate, facilitated by the AOE, but they're really um, conducted by educational peers. So um, largely uh, organized geographically, but it's, it's teachers, it's principals who are going into buildings for a day, asking questions, talking to, talking to students, talking to community members, talking to teachers, administrators, uh, and the like. Um, so, um, with the AOE kind of, you know, pulling, you know, doing the facilitation side of, of that work. Yeah, there's a question. Um, Representative James. Thanks. This is such helpful testimony. I, I was just wondering if you, um, from your point of view, see any way in which this kind of assessment and accountability system could or should be uh, beefed up or made ro more robust or that's it. Well, that's a great question. And it's a, a bit of a loaded, not loaded question. It's a bit of a particularly tricky question at this particular time that we stand because we don't, I mean, there's just so much that we don't know right now. Um, and we're relying. So this is a, this is a, you know, a, going back to the equality standards, the state in the past has had the integrated field reviews, we've had um, kind of summative assessments, SBAC um, um, and the like, uh, as a way to be able to collect data and find out what's going on in, sc um, in schools. We, we don't have that information right now. You know, we're really relying on those local comprehensive assessments um, and we're really working right now. For example, we have a, uh, we've, we've contract contracted with WestEd uh, on a data literacy professional development for uh, LEAs so that they can be smarter about um, both how to gather data, how to interpret data. Um, we, had, uh, we had 300 people show up for our first one of these sessions a couple weeks ago uh, because, uh, you know, because we've uh, aligned it with the recovery plans and schools are really trying to figure out, you know, I, I, you know, it's a deficit model for me to say this, but you know, where is the learning loss? Is there learning loss? Where are the, you know, where are the students struggling? Um, and probably, as you know, on the recovery plan, we have you know, organized around three different pillars of, of re-engagement, mental health, and uh, academic achievement. Um, and really trying to figure out how do we gather this information? So to get back to your initial question of like, how do you beef up the system? Um, 
in a perfect world, I think this is, you know, there, there are maybe individual parts of this that I might have a, a little bit of an argument with um, and someone else might have a different argument with. I think overall it kind of holds together pretty well. Um, in the COVID world that we've been living in, there's just so much we don't know. Um, and this, you know, this is gonna provide us with a whole bunch of new data to be able to, to think about going forward to say, what are we doing well? Uh, and what, uh, you know, for example, do we need to be more uh, prescriptive, prescriptive um, about the local comprehensive assessment system? Um, just, I'm, I'm making up an example of, of some, a question that we might ask ourselves on this. Um, um, is our schools able to use their local comprehensive assessment systems to really look at how performance um, is similar and different by particular student groups. And if not, that's something schools really should be using those local assessment systems to, you know, to be thinking about and looking at as well. Um, and what would the role of the agency be? It just really depends on, on what we're getting right now. I can also say that, you know, um, as of last Thursday, yeah, we could go today. Um, the, uh, the needs assessment, which is the first part of the recovery plan started rolling in. We're really impressed with the quality of uh, the, the review that schools are doing and identifying what those needs are, what the data sources that they're relying on are, and what the data sources that they, um, uh, that they need help identifying are. And you know, they're, they're doing, they're, they're really thorough and, and impressive, especially when being asked to do it on a, a very short timeline and with, you know, the world continuing to fall apart around them. So I don't know that it fully answers your question, but I, I, I you know, I, the last 14 months, there, there's just a whole lot of, I don't know anymore. And we'll just have to see where we, where we land uh, as we come out the other side. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank Happy you. Um, this has been a very interesting conversation in looking at uh, where we are with the EQ, what the EQS are, um, how they're assessed and, and looking at how we measure. Yeah. <laughs> um, there is a question in the waiting study that asks uh, whether, uh, how to ensure school districts are using funding to meet uh, EQS and improve student outcomes and opportunities. Do you see that as being something that would be a short or a lengthy process? Um, I think it's work that they should already be, that, that most are already doing. So I don't think it would be, because this is exactly what the, comp, uh, the continuous improvement plans are, is looking at the, the results of their education quality reviews, yeah. annual snapshots, IFRs, you know, to, to identify what those needs are. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And I'd also just say that, um, I, you know, something like the Ed Quality Standards sounds overwhelming, I think it's a 14 page document. You know, it's not, it's not something that, that is, um, you know, it, it, you know, it's not like the law book. It's not like title 16 that, you know, uh, that you, that it would take you a year to, to, to get through. Cause you know, you fall asleep reading it or whatever. It's, it's, it's really a, a very accessible document. So, um, I would encourage folks to, to look at it further if they have questions and I'm certainly willing to answer any of those and follow up. Thank you. And if there are, are sites on the website that uh, would be helpful for links would be helpful, if you could send those to Jesse for us would be great. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Sometimes yeah. it's a little hard to find those things. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'll send them to uh, for both uh, for, for a couple of different things. Okay, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay, and with that, uh, what I'd like to do, uh, um, if it's okay, we have Brad James here, but I'd like to give the committee a, just about a five minute break. Um, and I'm just looking to see if Brad is still here. Brad, yes. Brad, where are you? How long? I, do I, how long? Uh, I, I don't know if I'm popped up on the screen or not. I can see myself, but, I, but I'm here and, and a break is just fine with me. Okay. Five minutes okay? Or do you need 10? Five. Coop says five. We're going to take a five minute break. So we'll be back at 11.06. So, you know, about, we'll call it 11.12. That's six minutes. <laughs> See you at 11.12.